probably the most important field that informs biological anthropology is evolutionary biology. So let's talk about some of the most important concepts. Evolutionary biology is a big field and probably personally my favorite one. Um, there are so many different subfields within biology. We can see a few of them are right here. The ones at the top, these are fall within the realm of molecular biology, and then the ones on the bottom fall within evolutionary biology. Um, the one um, exception here, bioethics, well, that's everything. That just, you know, happened to be there on the chart. Um, but let's look at how this breaks down. Molecular biology is looking at the molecular basis of ac biological activity within cells. So we're zooming in really, really small and looking at how things are happening on this tiny molecular level. What happens when this molecule interacts with this other molecule? And that's really important, but it can be hard, hard sometimes to scale up these tiny, tiny reactions into bigger ideas. And that's where evolutionary biology comes in. So this is looking at the processes that produce the diversity of life that we see in the first place. So these are really looking at different scales for biology. Um, in molecular biology, we'll frequently find proximate reasoning, and evolutionary biology uses something called ultimate reasoning. We'll get to those in a second. But first, let's talk about another important concept in evolutionary biology and how it affects biological anthropology. The first one is the levels of biological organization. And this means we can look at distinct different scales. The first and the smallest is the atom. Really, that's the realm of physics, but if you put a couple of atoms together and now you get a molecule. Molecules are traditionally the purview of chemistry, but a lot of molecular biology is looking at the interaction of molecules with each other, and that's called the field of biochemistry. Next, we have genes because we have a very specific um, macromolecule that we use to uh, store hereditary information. Um, and then we also have organelles. What's the nucleus doing? What's the ribosomes doing? What's the what are the Golgi bodies doing? And if you put all of those organelles together, now you have a cell. You have a bunch of cells together of the same type, you get a tissue. Put a couple tissues together, you get an organ. You put all of the organs together um, in a particular system and you get an organ system. And you put all of the organ systems together in an individual and now you have an organism. Put a couple of different individuals together, now you have a population of a single species. And you put different species together, now you have an ecosystem. You can even go farther from this chart and consider the interaction between species and their environment. And then if you put the entire world together, we call that the biosphere. But why does this matter? Why do we care about these different levels of biological organization? These are important because different things happen at different levels. And different scientists will draw different conclusions because they're looking at different types of data. There are some really interesting debates within evolutionary biology, and in my opinion, some of them are due to the fact that people are looking at different things and looking at different levels of biological organization, and that will cause different people to think um, things are of differing importance. But another important thing is emergent properties. At each different level of biological organization, there's a different emergent property going on. And that's why um, you will see different things at different levels. An emergent property is simply something that is more than the sum of its parts. Um, one good example is traffic patterns. You cannot predict the overall pattern of traffic by simply looking at the decisions of one person. You have to look at everyone's decisions, and that's how a traffic pattern emerges. Yes, you can see a ripple effect or a butterfly effect based on the decisions of one single person, but that is a tendency, not a rule. You really do have to look at the entire system to see what the overall pattern is. And we see this all throughout biology. So in these first few levels of organization, none of it is alive. But all of a sudden we get to cells and we have life, they're alive. It's, it's really magical because there's no single component of a cell that gives it this life. It's all of this together Life is the emergent property at the cellular level. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what life is. Um, there are a couple different features that we see in all living creatures. They grow, they reproduce, 
um, they have a cellular structure, they have metabolism, or they need to consume energy so they can um, so they can live. Um, they maintain homeostasis, or they have uh, certain parameters that they need to keep within to stay alive. Uh, they have heredity, or they pass on their traits to their offspring, and they also respond to stimuli. Viruses are right at that line between alive and not alive. Most people fall on the side that they are not. So here we have our bacteriophages discussing, am I alive? You look alive. Nope, I'm not on your imagination. But let's go back to those types of reasoning I mentioned, proximate and ultimate reasoning. Proximate reasoning is when you're looking at the immediate cause. Think of this as a how or a what question. Ultimate reasoning, now we're looking at the evolutionary cause. This is a why. Proximate reasoning, now we're looking at physiological mechanisms. But ultimate reasoning, we're talking about the reason why those physiological mechanisms evolved in the first place. These are both really cool questions, but you do want to make sure that you're not confusing them. So let's look at an example. So we can ask, why do babies cry? In the short term, it's they're hungry, they're tired, or I don't know, ask a parent. There's so many different reasons. We think the evolutionary reason or the ultimate reason is that parents pay more attention to crying children. So it is beneficial for children to cry when they need something to make sure that they have the things they need to survive. And this is important because we don't want to confuse these proximate reasoning, proximate reasons when we are considering the evolutionary reason for why something evolved, especially a behavior in the first place. So what are the levels of biological organization and why are they important? <music>